Grace Tame has, in little over a month, become a household name, an inspiring and courageous young Australian who has spent the last 10 years turning her traumatic lived experience as a survivor of child sexual assault into advocacy for other survivors. She spent several months campaigning against the injustice of Tasmania's gag order that prevented survivors from self-identifying publicly. In the Let Her Speak campaign, she gained national attention, and in 2019, she finally won the right to speak out under her own name. Her advocacy and her courage are widely recognised, and this year she was named Our Australian of the Year. Before I continue, please be aware that this next section and the keynote discusses sexual abuse and trauma, which may be distressing for some people. If the content of this presentation brings up any concerns or distress, please reach out to 1800 RESPECT, that's 1800 737 732, or 1800RESPECT.org.au. I had the pleasure of meeting Grace a few weeks ago, and what struck me is how much of herself she gives, how much of her own healing and rebuilt strength she gives and risks every time she speaks publicly, because she believes sharing her lived experience will inform much-needed structural and social change. I learned from Grace that it can take years for a sexual assault survivor to share their story. Yet here she is, barely 26, telling her story on a national stage. From Grace, I'm also now much more aware that telling her story doesn't get easier to tell regardless of the size of the crowd or the mantle of Australian of the Year, something we sometimes forget. Grace's call to action has consistently been to ask us if we're listening, asking us to stand with her and other survivors in solidarity, asking us to show some understanding of what it takes to share lived experiences like hers. Now, it's customary for an audience to stand at the end of a keynote speech, a sign of respect for the story and the storytelling. In a few moments, I'd like to ask those of us in Sydney, and if you feel inclined around the rest of the country, to stand as a collective, and in doing so, recognise the enormous courage and the extraordinary impact one person can have to break the culture of silence. Grace consistently calls for Australia to make some noise. Your Excellencies, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, please stand with me now and let's deliver on her ask. Let's make some noise as we warmly welcome to the stage Grace Tame. Well, thank you all, um, and thank you, Sunita, for that very generous introduction. It's a, an honour to be here. And uh, this year's International Women's Day theme could not be more fitting. It could not be more true. Women lead. At this year's Australian of the Year honours, I was named one of the four recipients, and all of us are women. Leaders each representing a completely different cause and from a completely different background. I need not restate our global history of gender inequality, nor the remarkable leadership women have shown in the face of innumerable challenges to overcome oppression. And I need not remind us all that there is still so much work to be done. 
Widespread change is happening very quickly right now, and as such, we must be adaptable. A defining trait in female leaders the world over. Throughout history, women have challenged the false notion that showing strength and admitting weakness are mutually exclusive practices. A leader knows their strengths as well as their weaknesses and is empowered by both equally. Truly, one of the most important components of leadership is embracing vulnerability, embracing humanity, our shared truth. And that's it, our truth. Our truth is our power. Every single one of us is a leader because every single one of us has a truth, a story with unique potential to create change. A leader does not stand above the rest. A leader stands alongside their fellow champions, prepared to take direction as well as provide it, to listen, to encourage, and to unite. A leader's fearlessness is not so much an absence of fear as a refusal to let it stop them from moving forward. Indeed, it is through facing my greatest fears and witnessing and empowering others to do the same that I got here. Most of you already know my story, but let me take you back a little further. In April of 2010, I was battling severe anorexia, and truth be told, I still am. This illness had nearly taken my life the year prior and seen me hospitalized twice, bedridden and tube-fed, deemed on the verge of heart failure. Bone thin, I was picked on for the way that I looked. I'd just stopped living with my father for the first time since I was born, and my mother was pregnant, eight months pregnant, at 45. I was a 15-year-old student at a private all-girls school in Hobart. One morning, after an outpatient checkup, I arrived late to discover the rest of my Year 10 classmates were attending a driving lesson off campus that I'd completely forgotten about. Lapses like these weren't uncommon at this time. I was barely there. One of the senior teachers noticed me walking around aimlessly in the courtyard. He was well-respected, the head of maths and science, at the school for nearly 20 years. He'd taught me in year nine, and I thought he was funny. He told me he had a free period and asked if I'd come and chat with him in his office. He asked me about my illness. I talked, he listened. And he promised to help me, to guide me in my recovery. Then, over a period of months, he built my trust to a point where I felt safe sharing my fears and past trauma that underpinned my illness, like my experience of being sexually abused as a six-year-old by an older child who told me to go into a closet and undress before molesting me. The teacher gave me a key to his office, where there was always music playing, and it was always the same music. Simon and Garfunkel. He told me he would never hurt me, until he did, by way of a masterful reenactment that I didn't see coming, with an instruction to go into a closet and undress. Most of you know what came next. That is, I lost my virginity to a 58-year-old pedophile and spent the next six months being raped by him nearly every day at school on the floor of his office. It was a mere four months after the abuse stopped that I reported him to police. They found 28 multimedia files of child pornography on his computer. But as per the lasting impact of intense and manipulative grooming, I effectively defended him in my statement. Still only 16 then, I was terrified that he would find out I'd betrayed him and that he would kill me. He was sentenced to two years and 10 months in jail for maintaining a sexual relationship with a person under the age of 17. 
Repairing myself in the aftermath of all of this was certainly not a simple linear undertaking. For every step forward, there were steps back, steps to the side, and some steps almost off the edge. I saw counselor after counselor. I abused drugs. I drank. I moved overseas, cut myself, threw myself into study, dyed my hair, made amazing friends, got horrendous tattoos, found myself in violent relationships, worked for my childhood hero, practiced yoga. I even became a yoga teacher. I starved, I binged, and I starved again. One of the toughest challenges on my road to recovery was trying to speak about something we are taught is unspeakable. I felt completely disconnected from myself and everyone around me. Many people didn't know how to respond. That said, the ones who listened, the ones who were eager to understand even when they couldn't, made all the difference. But still, doubt lingers. How could I have been so stupid as to not see what this man was doing from the outset? Was it my fault? Should I have known it was a lie when he said he'd learned more from me than any of his other students? Maybe I should have been more alarmed when he asked me if I knew where my clitoris was and then laughed at me when I said no. It was when he was released after serving only 19 months for abusing me almost every day, sorry, maintaining a sexual relationship with me as a 15-year-old, and then spoke freely on Facebook and to the media about how awesome and enviable it was, that I realized we had everything around the wrong way. Add the fact that this man was awarded a federally funded PhD scholarship at the only university in my home state while my mother was studying there. My mother, who hadn't had the opportunity to do so growing up. She soon dropped out because of his presence, but he remained. And in fact, he was put into student accommodation with fresh 17 and 18-year-old undergraduates. And despite multiple reports to police by fellow students of his predatory behavior, and despite once again being convicted and jailed for his vulgar public comments during his PhD tenure, he was eventually awarded a doctorate. After all this, it became quite obvious to me why child sexual abuse remains ubiquitous in our society. Because while predators retain the power to get exactly what they want, the power to feign remorse, the power to objectify their targets, it is the innocent, survivors and bystanders alike, who are burdened by shame-induced silence. In 2017, I reached out to groundbreaking freelance journalist and fellow survivor, my dear friend, Nina Fennell, with a view to share my story publicly under my own name, to raise awareness and educate others about the prolonged psychological manipulation that belies abuse. Yet, after months of recounting re-traumatizing details, tirelessly transposed by Nina, we discovered we were barred from sharing them by Section 194K of Tasmania's Evidence Act, which made it illegal for survivors of child sexual abuse to be identified in the media, even after turning 18, even with their consent. Using my case as the foundation, Nina created the Let Her Speak campaign to reform this law. We were then joined by 16 other brave survivors who lent their stories to the cause, and I thank them all. The law was officially changed in April last year, almost 10 years to the day from the beginning of my story. It is so important for our nation, for the whole world in fact, to listen to survivors' stories. Whilst they are disturbing to hear and the reality Sorry, the reality of what goes on behind closed doors is more so. And the more details we omit for fear of disturbance, the more we soften these crimes, the more we shield perpetrators from the shame that is resultantly misdirected towards survivors. When we share, we heal, we reconnect, and we grow, both as individuals and as a united collective. History lived experience, the whole truth, 
unsanitized and unedited, is our greatest learning resource. It is what leads social and structural change. The upshot of allowing predators a voice, but not survivors, encourages their criminal behavior. Through working with Nina, finally winning the right to speak, and talking with fellow campaign leaders and countless other women and men who have since come forward, it has become clear that there is the potential to do so much more to support survivors, to thrive in life beyond their trauma, and more so, to end child sexual abuse. It is my mission to do so, and it begins right now. As a fortunate nation, we have a particular obligation to protect our most vulnerable, our innocent children, and especially those who face further challenges due to circumstance or being part of a minority group or geographical location. And there are three key areas we can focus on to achieve this. Number one is how we lead, invite, listen and accept the conversation and lived experience of survivors of sexual abuse. You've heard me say it before, it all begins with conversation. Number two is what we do to expand our understanding of this heinous crime, in particular the grooming process, through both formal and informal education. Number three is how we provide a consistent national framework that supports survivors and their loved ones, not just in their recovery, but also with policies that disempower and deter predators from action. So, what is it that we must do? First and foremost, let's keep talking about it. It's that simple. Let's start by opening up. It's up to us as a community, as a country, to create a space and lead a national movement where survivors feel supported and free to share their truths. Let's lead a paradigm shift of shame away from those who have been abused and onto abusive behavior. Let's share the platform to remind all survivors that their individual voice matters amongst the collective. Every story is imbued with unique, catalytic, educative potential that can only be told by its subject. Let us genuinely listen, actively, without judgment and without advice, to demonstrate empathy and reassure that it is, and never was, our fault. Remember, though, there is a difference between interrogation and listening to inquire and learn from experience. We are all human beings, and as such, we build connection through communication. On average, it takes 23.9 years for survivors of child sexual abuse to be able to speak about their experience. Such is the success of predators at instilling fear and self-doubt in the minds of their targets. More so than they are masters of destroying our trust in, our, in others, predators are masters of destroying our trust in our own judgment, of destroying our trust in ourselves. Such is the power of shame. A power, though, that is no match for love. When I disclosed my abuse to another of my teachers, Dr. William Simon, his absolute belief in me was the only assurance I needed to tell the police. It helped me recover a little of my lost faith in humanity. Also, to have been heard and accepted by a male teacher after being abused by a male teacher challenged the false ideology that this is a gendered issue on which men are unwelcome to participate. We are all in this together. Just as the impacts of sexual abuse are borne by all of us, so too are solutions born of all of us. This issue is far too important to be politicized. Predators capitalize when we fight amongst ourselves and pull focus away from their criminal behavior. There isn't a single rigid solution. Solutions will naturally come in due course by allowing and enabling voices to be heard. Certainly, talking about child sexual abuse won't eradicate it, but we can't fix a problem we don't discuss. And so it begins with conversation. Raw conversation to learn from lived experience, to heal. 
raw conversation to learn about the lasting trauma to heal. Raw conversation. I have often said that the trauma doesn't end when the abuse itself does. The control is maintained through its lasting, invisible impacts. I have scar tissue on the inside of my body, and so too will the psychological damage last a lifetime. Indeed, he taught me to hate my very womanhood, not only because he wanted me for my child's body or because of the way that he spoke about other women, but because of what he did to me when my body was at the mercy of its female biology. As an anorexic 15-year-old, I'd only had a handful of periods before the abuse began. I was still learning to manage and understand them. To him, they meant more pleasure. Undeterred by the thought of the pain I was in, he raped me incessantly during these times because he didn't have to wear a condom. And that felt better to him. Of course, he did put a towel down to protect the carpet. I became terrified of having my period. <laughs> and to this day, my association with it is founded on those traumatic memories stored permanently in my cells and in my mind. Much as for the longest time, I didn't want to run because of him. I was in my sports uniform the first time he succeeded in penetrating me. He'd tried before, but my body rejected him through trauma-induced contractions. But in the afternoon, on the day of the school athletics carnival in August 2010, he forced his way in regardless. He was telling me he couldn't believe the amount of cellulite he could see on the girls racing at the track. As many of you know, I have rediscovered my love of running. Two years ago, I started training and competing at an elite level. But as such, two years ago, I also stopped menstruating. Running had given me back a child's body. So although I regained something lost during the abuse, it came at the expense of another. My doctors warned this could affect my chances of having children. So it is with a mixture of relief, pain, irony, but ultimately triumph that I share with you today the fact that on Monday, one week to the day from International Women's Day, my period came back. <laughs> it came back just before my morning run with the love of my life, <laughs> who's here today. I can see you. <laughs> and with whom I hope to make a family. See how sexual abuse and its repercussions are also stiflingly complex. Thus, we need to expand the conversation in order to create more awareness and education, particularly around the process of grooming. Grooming. It's a concept that makes us shudder, and as such, we rarely hear about it. To the benefit of predators. While it haunts us and we avoid properly talking about it, the complexity and secrecy of this criminal behavior is what predators thrive on. In turn, we enable them to charm and manipulate not just their targets, but all of us at once. Family, friends, colleagues, and community members. And this, this must stop. Our discomfort, our fear, and the resulting ignorance needs to stop giving perpetrators the protection, power, and confidence that allows them to operate. As a start, we should all be aware of what has been identified as the six phases of grooming, which certainly ring true in my experience. Number one is targeting, that is, identifying a vulnerable individual. In my case, I was an innocent child, but I was also anorexic, with significant change happening at home. Number two is gaining trust. That is, establishing a friendship and falsely lulling the target into a sense of security by empathizing and assuring safety. For me, that was what I thought was listening to my challenges, empathizing with my situation, and providing me a safe space when I needed it. Number three is filling a need. 
that is, playing the person that fills the gap in the target's mental and emotional support. In my case, although I was surrounded by an incredibly attentive family and team of medical professionals, most of their support came in the form of tough love. The teacher thus assumed the role of sympathizer, telling me everything I wanted to hear. Number four is isolating. That is, driving wedges between the target and their genuine supporters. This involves pushing certain people away, but exploiting others. I remember studying the film Iron Jawed Angels that year in history. In one of the scenes, the main character is force-fed, much like I had been. Aware of my distress upon seeing this, my history teacher quietly led me out of the classroom. And although I said nothing, she took me to his office, where she left me with him, panicked in tears. It wasn't until many years later that I questioned why she and other staff would take me to him when I was upset. Staff he privately mocked and referred to as the Menopausal Virgins Club. Did he tell them to do so? He must have done. Number five is sexualizing. That is, gradually introducing sexual content so as to normalize it. In my case, in conjunction with explicit conversation, I was carefully exposed to material that glorified relationships between characters with significant age differences. There was one particular film he made me watch called The Prime of Miss Jean Brody, the last line of which is, give me a girl at an impressionable age and she is mine for life. And remember how I said Simon and Garfunkel was always playing? Well, their music was the soundtrack to The Graduate. He made me watch that too. And thus, both literally and figuratively, it was the sound of silence that underscored my experience of pedophilic abuse, haunting and unending. You know the lyrics. The vision that was planted in my brain still remains within the sound of silence. Number six is maintaining control. That is, striking a perfect balance between causing pain and providing relief from that pain. To condition the target to feel guilt at the thought of exposing a person who appears to care for them. By way of physical intimidation combined with veiled threats, Abusers scare you into silent submission. At over six foot, he towered above me. He once told me a story about a friend of his who sought revenge on a woman by digging her eyes out with a spoon. He told me he'd killed people as a soldier. He'd also sit outside on my street at night in his car to watch me undress through the window. I was already embarrassed by my changing shape as a young teenager in eating disorder recovery. I remember standing naked behind his desk after he had just raped me on the floor and asking him if he thought I was fat. He looked me up and down and he said, well, you could do with some more exercise, like I was a dog. But he also told me I was beautiful. It's ugly, it's complicated, but as we talk more about sexual abuse, our lived experiences and what we know, our understanding of this premeditated evil will continue to develop. We need to warn our children, age appropriately of course, of the signs and characteristic behaviors whilst educating how to report it should it happen to them or those around them. We need to lead them and remind them that they too are leaders. And finally, we need structural change. We need to challenge our current national systems in pursuit of ones that support and protect survivors and ones that deal with crimes in proportion to their severity. Since I was announced as Australian of the Year just over a month ago, hundreds upon hundreds 
of fellow child sexual abuse survivors have reached out to me to tell their stories, to cry with me. Stories they th thought they would take with them to their grave out of shame for being subjected to something that was not their fault. Stories of a kind of suffering that had previously not been able to be explained. Stories of grooming. I am one of the luckiest ones who survived, who was believed and surrounded by love. And what this shows me is that despite this problem still existing, and despite a personal history of trauma that is still ongoing, it is possible to heal, to thrive, and to live a wonderful life. It is my mission and my duty as a survivor and as a survivor with a voice to continue working towards eradicating child sexual abuse. I won't stop until it does. And I invite you all to join me as fellow leaders as we continue to lead through challenges, we not only learn and progress, we strengthen our bonds as human beings, united in the struggle, regardless of the outcome. And that, in of itself, is a positive outcome. Truly, a challenge we commit to face together as a collective of leaders is not really a challenge at all. It is a triumph, a triumph of love over hatred. Thank you all.